All right, we're in week number three of this series we've been in entitled Be Free. And if you're just now joining us, we say, say welcome to all of our first-time guests. But I encourage you to go back to our website or download our app and go back for the last two weeks, watch week one, watch week two, because they kind of build on each other. But today we're, we're taking off and, and want to remind you that what we're trying to say is that God understands where we are. He loves us where we are, but he doesn't want to leave us where we are. And the day that we got born again, God wanted us to come to know him, but then he wants us to find freedom. He wants us to discover what our purpose is on this earth, and then he wants us to ultimately live in our lives to make a difference, or we say make an impact, have an impact on the lives of other people. And it's not like you go through this one time and you made it. No matter how long you've been walking with God, there's more of God to know. Come on, say amen, somebody. And no matter how free you think you already are, can I tell you, there's still more freedom to come. Even when you think I've gotten rid of all the big stuff, even the little bitty nuances, the way in which the world has changed your personality, trauma has caused you to respond in certain ways, God wants to set us free more and more, like peeling an onion back. He wants to keep giving us more freedom so we can figure out more of our purpose and live our lives being even more of a blessing. So all month long, we've been re- working to remove whatever obstacles that might limit the intimacy we have with God so we can really be free. Because we believe that the way to get free is not to beat yourself up and try real hard to get free. The way to get free is get closer to God. And the closer I get to him and the more I learn of him and the the more I have intimate connection with him, I'm going to lose the appetite and the taste for some of the things that used to have me bound. Things that used to bother me won't bother me like they used to the closer I get to God. Shout amen, somebody. And we told you in the Garden of Eden, there were a lot of different types of trees in the garden. Adam and Eve had free reign. You can eat from all the trees in the garden. But there's one tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were told, don't eat from that tree. And there was another tree called the tree of life. They could eat all they wanted from that one. But just the one tree in the middle of the garden, they were told not to eat from that tree. We've told you that everything in our lives is filtered through one of these two trees. Whenever we start looking at our relationship with God like it's a duty, like I got to do this, I got to go to church, I got to pray, I got to give my tithes, I got to read my Bible, I got to serve at church, what we're really doing is filtering our lives through the knowledge of of good and evil. When we start looking at other people, we're critical, we're judgmental, we we got raked them over with a fine-tooth comb, we don't give anybody the benefit of the doubt, we don't think the best of other people and, 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 and assume the best instead of the worst. What we're really doing without realizing it is living from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan is always trying to get us to look at ourselves and look at other people from this tree. Because when we look at people from the tree of life, we're going to look at them with grace in our eyes. We're going to look at them with not, not with judgmental eyes. Even when we share with them maybe something that they need to adjust, we're going to do it with, with hope and optimism and belief in their potential. But the enemy is always trying to get us to stay stuck in this wrong tree, looking at ourselves and looking at other people from that tree. Well, last week we explored how to walk in the Spirit as a way to maintain our freedom and enjoy the life God has for us. And one of the things we told you last week, if we're going to walk in the Spirit, we've got to do three things. We've got to, number one, learn how to focus on the things of the Spirit. Come on, I can't keep staring at the wrong fruit and think I'm going to get the right results. I can't keep putting my eyes on the wrong thing and hanging out with the wrong people and, and spending my attention on the wrong things and think I'm going to somehow magically come out with a better result. We got to focus on the things of the spirit. Then we tell you, we got to feed your spirit. What do you, remember the saying when you're growing up, you are what you eat? Well, that's true naturally, but it's even more true spiritually. Whatever we become is a result of what we've been feeding ourselves. So we got to feed our spirits the right things. Then we told you last that we have to learn how to follow the Holy Spirit, listen to his voice, obey his prompting so we can follow the direction of Holy Spirit. Well, today I want to give you another set of keys that I believe will help us to walk in and maintain our freedom. So somebody say this. Say, all the way up. up. Let's say it like me. Shout, all the way up. up. Say it one more time. Shout, all the way up. up. Key number one is this. You got to give up. Give all the way up. Key number one, we we got to give up. Not kind of, sort of give up. Got to give all the way up. In other words, we got to fully surrender to God. Give up. Give all the way up. Psalm 23, verse 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? I can't hear you. I'll dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? I'll dwell in his house forever. How many know that everything we need, everything we desire, everything we could ever want for, everything we could ever dream of is already in God's house? I don't mean in, in the church building. I know we refer to this as the house of God, but what I'm talking about is in relationship with God, in connection with him, everything that is worth having is already in there. In other words, anybody I should be talking to, I should be able to talk to God about me talking to them. 
Any phone conversation I have, what I'm saying on that call, I should be able to invite God to listen in. Because whether you know it or not, he's listening in anyway. I mean, anything I'm typing in my DMs, I ought to be able to ask God, is it okay to say this, God? Come on, everybody keep looking ahead and smiling. <laughs> you get that weird look, somebody's going to think I'm talking about you. No, everything that is worth having that we desire that we need is already in the house where God is. And when we understand that, intellectually we know that, but so many times without realizing we find ourselves chasing something that's outside the house. We find ourselves doing like Adam and Eve. They had everything they needed, but they were pursuing something else that they really, God didn't tell them that they should have in their lives. And kind of like Adam and Eve, they, they literally had everything they could ever need. You think about the Garden of Eden. The Bible describes it as a place where they had food, they had water, they had gold. Adam had two jobs. Come on, somebody. Adam had a nice plush place to live. They had intimate relationship with God. They could come down in the cool of the day and have conversations with God. They had companionship. You know, the Bible said that God created Eve so they wouldn't have to be alone. They, 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 they had transparency. They were living authentic lives. The Bible says they were both naked and neither one of them was ashamed. In other words, they didn't have anything to hide. Can I just say it this way? Adam wasn't scared to put his phone down and walk into the other room. <laughs> Don't get me started on that one. <laughs> Point I'm making is that they had everything they could possibly need, but instead of being content and thanking God for what they had, they were struggling because they thought there was something else they were missing out on. And I said this last week, their world was so perfect that God really only gave them one rule. Don't touch that tree in the middle of the garden. But because human nature is obsessed with whatever is forbidden, whatever seems secret or hidden, whatever seems taboo or the unknown, because of that, they took the route of trying to get independence from God. Let me say to you real clearly, it is a mistake to ever equate independence with freedom. Because independence only results in freedom when we have the capacity to do better all by ourselves. Only way you can say that my independence is leading me to freedom is whatever I'm breaking free from, I can do better without it. And that tells you right there, our independence from God is never going to lead to us having real freedom. In fact, if anything, it's going to always be the other way around. We're going to have less freedom when we try to break free from God. See, the reason that humanity tends to seek independence apart from God, is due to either immaturity or is due to trauma. The reason why we, 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 we acknowledge intellectually that I know I got everything I need right here with God, but we still allow ourselves to seek something outside the house. We still try to have a relationship with somebody that's outside the house. We still try to flirt around with something that's outside the house. It's either as a result of immaturity and sometimes as a result of trauma, and sometimes it's both of them. We look at the life of Adam and Eve. I mean, think about it. We said it already. Adam was supposed to be covering his wife. He was supposed to protect his wife. But instead, he stood there while his wife Eve was deceived because both of them were too immature to realize how good they already had it. I mean, sometimes we don't know how good we have it until the thing we have is gone. I'm preaching better than you saying Amen. <laughs> Anybody in here ever remember being, being 16, 17, and, and saying this, I can't wait till I'm grown out of this house? <laughs> Anybody who used to say that ever look around and say, man, I wish somebody was still paying all them bills like they used to pay? <laughs> wish I could just come in this house and just eat food and no one have no idea how it shows back up in the refrigerator? And <laughs> In other words, that desire to, to, to want to be out of the house for some of us was because we were too immature to realize how good we already have it. Well, now, that's the immaturity side. But the other side of it is sometimes teenagers long to be outside the house, long to be free, because the home that they've grown up in is not a house that resembles Psalm 23. It's not a house that has green pastures, not a home that has steel waters. There's chaos. There's confusion. There's fighting going on. And sometimes in an effort to get away from all of that, they want to be gone out there on their own. Sometimes they're growing up in a house that is filled with not, not beauty but lack and poverty. Sometimes chaos and disorder. Sometimes our, our teenagers have grown up in a house where all they ever hear is criticism and judgmentalism. Sometimes they've grown up in a home where there's toxicity and there's abuse and there's fear. And so they long to get away from that, can't wait to get out and go to college and never show back up at home again. And unfortunately, if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes 
Our teenagers even get to the place where they can't wait to get 18 so they can get away and not have to go to church again because church has also sometimes represented nothing but judgment, nothing but a bunch of rules, and left them feeling like every time they make a bad, bad, bad decision, God is right there waiting to be mad at them like their parents always mad at them. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. amen. And if I could speak to that group of teenagers that have grown up in an environment of trauma, all I can tell you is no matter how bad it's been with mom and dad, no matter how bad it might have even been in your church experience, can I tell you this? God is not like that. Amen. Which means don't equate God and how he looks at you with the way some other human being has looked at you. If I could take a moment and just preach to my teenagers, I'd say this to you. Independence from God does not mean that it's, it's freedom. It's not freedom. It's really bondage. See, independence is only a pathway to freedom, as I said, when you have the capacity to be better by yourself. We are never better when we're freed from God. If I could take a moment to talk to my teenagers, I'd say this to you. True freedom is only found when we surrender to the only one who is worthy of the name that is above every other name. I'm talking to every one of my, my young people in here for, for a moment. See, if you're going to lift up your hands to somebody, come on, lift them up. Lift them all the way up. But don't just lift them up to your favorite artist, your favorite rapper, your favorite R&B artist. If you're going to lift your hands up, lift your hands up past your imperfect parents. Lift them up past your imperfect pastors. Lift them up past your imperfect civil leaders and presidents. If you're going to lift your hands up, lift them all the way up to the king of kings. Come on, lift them up to the Lord of lords. Lift your hands up to the great I am, to the alpha, to the omega, to the beginning and the end. Come on, he's the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God, the everlasting father. If you're going to lift him up, lift him all the way up. His name is Jesus. And there's no Lord who's more loving. There's no king who's more kind. There's no judge who's more just. There's no master who is more merciful. If you're going to lift your hands up, young people, lift them all the way up to the one, the only one who is worthy of all of our praise. See, tree of life thinking causes us to throw up our hands, but not in fear. We throw our hands up in absolute trust toward God. I love Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in everything you do, and he will show you which path to take. See, if, I, if, I, if you're asking me to de- describe what it's like, to, what it means to say I'm saved or to give my life to the Lord, I really would describe it in one word, and that's surrender. And that's really what what, what it boils down to is every one of us has to come to the place where we learn how to surrender to the process. So many times we watch this, we want the result, but we don't want the process. So many times we want our lives to be successful, but we don't want to have to adjust and do the stuff God is saying to do. It's amazing how many people end up mad at God, but if we honestly get get real with ourselves, sometimes the reason why our lives are in a wreck is because we did the exact opposite of what God was trying to tell us to do. And then we get mad because we've sown seed in a direction and harvest actually shows up. The thing I love about God is even when we sown the wrong seed, come on, he's merciful enough. Come on, if we'll repent, which means turn around and go the other way, he'll help us dig up that seed and still give us a better harvest. But what I'm saying is we got to get to the place where we don't just want the result, we want the process. I don't want to just pray a prayer on Saturday and everything I've ever wished for is in my lap on Sunday. Because when that happens, I haven't learned the process. Sometimes God is more concerned about us learning the process than just giving us the thing that we want on the spot. Now, hear me out. God will never put sickness on you to teach you a lesson. That's not the process. God will never have you homeless so he can teach you a lesson. But God will sometimes inconvenience us. He will sometimes make you deal with a coworker that you really don't want to have to deal with. Or a supervisor you'd rather get away from that's getting on your last nerve and you've been praying for them and the more you pray for them to be transferred, you have to work more days with them than you were working before. And sometimes God is doing that because the process is trying to help us realize that everything God has for us does does not always come with an easy button. Sometimes God wants to give us the thing we desire but develop our character in the process. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. Because the day we get born again, the day we get saved, our spirit gets saved, but we got the same body we had before. That means sometimes, sometimes we have some of the same appetites, desires that we had before we got saved. Anybody willing to admit that every now and then you have a desire that you had before you got saved? The rest of y'all are lying. I cast the devil out of you in the name of... Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Every, every now and then you have a desire that creeps up. You have a thought that comes to your mind, and the spirit of cuss want to drop on your lips. Hmm. 
You have this, this dream of strangling somebody that works, <laughs> keep, keep bothering you. What am I saying? Just because you got saved, your spirit got saved, but your body didn't get saved. Why well, says your mind didn't get saved? That's why the Bible says we have to renew our minds. Your emotions didn't get saved. That's why we have to learn how to, to dominate our emotions, learn how to get control over them before they take control of us. Come on, say amen, somebody. That's why we have to learn how to submit our will. Because our spirit gets saved, but our mind, will, and emotions are still radical sinners that have to be renewed and tamed and brought into line. So the one word that really sums up salvation for me is surrender. And God wants us to get better at learning how to surrender. If you really want to know what happens when salvation kicks in, God wants us to surrender. That's why I tell you all the time, God's not asking you to put together a long laundry list of all the stuff you promise to not do anymore. Because I remember growing up, man, and they used to say, you need to learn, you need to stop smoking, stop drinking, stop cussing, stop lying, stop cheating, stop fornicating so you can get saved. And I remember thinking, man. But the reality is, if I had the ability on my own to stop smoking, drinking, cussing, lying, stealing, cheating, fornicating, doing all the stuff and fix it all by myself, watch this, God would have never needed to send Jesus. He gave the Jews the law so they could realize you can never keep all these rules. Then he sent Jesus to show them. After they got exhausted realizing we could never do this by ourselves, he sent Jesus so that Jesus could live a perfect life, be crucified unjustly, be raised from the dead by the power of God so that God could then take his blood and apply it to your account and my account. So even though we have blown it, he treats us like we have never sinned a day in our lives. You ought to shout and thank God because he's so good to us. That's why I tell people, if you're smoking weed, bring it with you. God's not intimidated by it. Now, I didn't say it's okay for you to smoke weed. Don't go out of here misinterpreting me. What I said is God's not asking you to fix that before you show up. If you, if you are stuck right now in alcoholism, you got to wake up in the morning to get a drink. And you show up at church smelling like it. Don't stay away because you smell like it. Come and sit up here as close as you want to sit, man. What I'm saying is right now, if you're living in a situation with somebody you know you shouldn't be living to because you're not married to them, don't stay away embarrassed and try to get myself right before I start coming to church. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I'm saying to you, God already knows that he knew it before you started it. He still loves you in it. And what he wants you to do is just make a decision to surrender to him. Then what he'll do, he'll change you on the inside. Then if you're in a good church where you're going to be taught the word the right way like you're in right now, he'll then take you by the hand like a kid going to kindergarten and teach us how to get free from anything he really wants us to get free from. You ought to shout like you're grateful to God, man. I want you to make this confession. I want you to say this as loud as you can. Say, Jesus, I surrender. You have the right to govern my life, my body, my career, my money, my time, my decisions, my attitude, my education, my worldview, my politics, and my relationships. I surrender because you are God and you have no equal. If you really mean that, give God the biggest shout you got. Come on, give him a shout. Come on, give him a shout. Yeah. I surrender, God. Come on. I'm done fighting you, God. I give up, God. Come on, throw both hands up. Come on, I give up, God. The reason why we tell you to put your hands in there, it's the universal sign of surrender. If the cop stops you, you surrender. If the criminal puts a gun on you, I surrender. And what God is saying, I'm not threatening you, but I still want you to throw your hands up and surrender. Because if you surrender to God, watch it, he'll take you to a life that's better than the one you made by yourself. That's why I dare you, I double dog dare you to give God one year, man. This is the one year challenge here at Impact. Give God one year. Where for one year, you stop treating God like a smorgasbord, where you take a little bit of that. Yeah, I'll have some of that, God. No, I don't want to do that. No, I don't want to do all that forgiving people stuff. I'll take a little bit of this, God. I don't want that. Give God one year where everything we ask you to do here at Impact Church, you just say yes and do it. We're not going to ask you anything crazy. We're asking you to stop being a, a professional visitor and go ahead and join the church. You checked us out long enough. Go ahead and join now. Go to the membership class. Go through the growth track class. Don't just go through one class. Go through all of them so you can get plugged into a dream team. Start serving somewhere. Just do it for one year. If it doesn't work, quit. Do it for one year. 
For one year, you actually go to small groups during small group semester. Even though you're not a people person, I don't like being around folks like that. <laughs> Do it for one year. See what happens if you go all in. For one year, watch this, tithe and make a commitment I'm not going to miss. Automate it so it comes out automatically so you're not even, not even tempted to go back and take it. Do it for one year. I'm saying as your pastor, if after one year your finances aren't better, if your mental life is not better, if, you're, if, you're, if, if you haven't gotten more healed in your heart in one year, stop doing all of it, man. But see, you'll never know what kind of life God can give you if you keep exploring the one you created instead of giving him a chance to show you the one that he can create for you. I'm preaching real good. <laughs> Key number two is this. You got to speak up. Speak all the way up. Speak up. Speak all the way up. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power. The word power means the direction. If you look it up in Hebrew, it literally means it's in the hand of the tongue. What it's referring to whichever hand, whichever direction the tongue goes, that's the direction that your life will go. Death and life are in the direction of the tongue. That lines up with James chapter 1 where the Bible talks about that, that the tongue is compared to the bit we put in a horse's mouth and the rudder on the bottom of a ship. If you think about this big old horse, they put a bit in his mouth. You pull the reins to the right, he goes to the right. You pull the reins to the left, he goes to the left. That big old ship in the ocean has a rudder underneath the water that is, is, is minuscule compared to the size of the ship above the water. And what the Bible says is your tongue is just like that bit in the horse's mouth. My tongue is just like that rudder on the ship. Watch this. Whichever direction your tongue goes is going to take your life with it. Death and life are in the power, the direction of the tongue. And those who love it will eat the fruit that comes from whatever they're saying. So by speak up, I don't mean speak loud. I mean speak higher. I mean elevate your words to a higher plane. Romans 8, 2 says this, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. In other words, the law of life is higher than the law of sin and death. And sometimes you got to call upon a higher law to supersede a lower law. It's kind of like the law, the law of lift. You know, when, when you get into an airplane, the law of gravity never stops. How I many you know the law of gravity? It's a law because it works all the time. If you don't believe it works, come up here on this stage, close your eyes, and walk off the side here. And, and I want you to pray in the spirit as you do so. Let's see if you levitate or if the law of gravity kicks in, you, hit, you bite this carpet. The law of gravity don't care if you're black, if you're white, if you're, if you're light-skinned, if you're dark-skinned. It doesn't care if you're, if you're overweight or underweight. It don't care if you're American, if you're, if you're Chinese. It don't care if you're rich, if you're poor. The law of gravity works. Watch this. It works all the time. Can I tell you this? Even when you get into an airplane, the law of gravity is still working. When that plane takes off, gravity, the whole time you're flying, is pulling it toward the earth. The reason it doesn't come back down to the earth is because while the law of gravity is working, watch this, there's a higher law that supersedes it. It's called the law of lift. And when the law of lift with the right propulsion takes over, then the law of lift can cause that huge, heavy metal tube carrying all those people to travel to a place safely and land safely. Why? Because the whole time that plane's in the air, the law of lift is overseeding or superseding, I should say, the law of gravity. What God is saying is there's a law in the earth that is the law of sin and death, but there's a law that is more powerful than that one. It's the law of life. And sometimes you got to call upon a higher law. you gotta, you got to take it to the manager above them. You know, I was, uh, you know, one of the things I, I enjoy doing is, is uh, negotiating. I, I, I negotiate cars. Uh, every car we've ever bought, man, I, I always get a good deal on the car. I, I've actually become a bit of a, of a pro at this. April hates going to the car dealership with me because, you know, I, I've literally been offered a job at two different dealerships after I sat and negotiated the car. And so I've adopted a, a lady here in our church. She's, she's kind of become an adopted mother to me, Minister Gina Halliburton. Her husband passed away a few years ago, and and it was time for her lease to, to come up to be turned in. And so I didn't want her to be taken advantage of. So I told her, before you do anything, don't talk to anybody. You tell them to call me. Give them my number. Tell them to call me. And so for the last couple of weeks, I've been negotiating a new vehicle for her. She told me what she wanted. So I was negotiating the deal and got, got, it, got it all worked out. And I'll, I'll give you a hint. When, when you go in to, to get a car, the first thing they're going to ask you is, what do you want your payments to be? Wrong question. Don't tell them what you want your payments to be because they're going to work the numbers just to make you have the payment. What we want to do is get this car down to what is the lowest amount I can get it to. So I worked the deal, got it down to the lowest amount. So we're down there at, at the dealership, and she's test driving these two that she was trying to decide. She decided which one she wanted. And so I told the guy, we got the price just right. Everything is perfect. This is the vehicle she wants. 
And I said, this was last week. I said, we'll be back at the end of the month on the 30th to sign the papers and get the car. Well, I told him that because she had already paid her lease, and she paid it for the whole month. And so he's like, well, no, I, I, can't, I can't hold this car for two weeks. She needs to she go ahead and turn her car in today, and then she, it doesn't matter. You know, they, they're not going to penalize you for turning in early. I said, no, they're not going to penalize her, but she's already paid for the whole month. Why would she turn it in at the middle of the month and give away that money? I said, I promise you we'll come back. Hey, we'll, we'll give you whatever deposit you need. Whatever you need us to sign, we are coming back. We're not just going to walk out. We'll give you what you need to guarantee we're coming back. But I'm not about to have her walk out of here today, take this car. Then he said, well, you, you don't have to turn in today. She can take the other one, too. I said, why would she need to drive two cars? I'm like, what part of this are you not understanding? We're not leaving with this car today as long as she still has her, her money out here. I said, are you all going to refund her part of her money? He said, no, we can't do that. So he, then he gets up, well, let me go talk to my manager. I said, you go talk to whoever you want to go talk to. We're not leaving out of here when she'd already paid for her lease. So he comes back and, well, no, we're not going to be able to do that. And I can't hold to the end of the month. I said, all right. Well, I shook his hand and said, well, appreciate it. Well, if we still need the car at the end of the month, then I'll call you back if we don't know where about it. And, you know, I said a little rougher than that. I'm, trying, I'm, giving, the, <laughs> I'm giving the church version of what I did. But as I'm walking out, Gina's with me, and I, I realized she'd never seen me like this. And she walking out like this. <laughs> she had this stunned look on her face. I told her, I said, don't worry about it. This is what I do. Because <laughs> he think we just lost the deal and now we got to start over. I said, trust me, before the night is over or by tomorrow morning, he's going to call me back. <laughs> Next morning, he blowing my phone up. <laughs> blowing my phone up. Mr. Davis, what if <laughs> we cut your mother a check for half of her lease? I was like, you could have did that yesterday and we didn't have to go through all these dramatics point I'm making is, watch this, sometimes you got to appeal to a higher authority. Sometimes when your life has gotten stuck in doubt and sickness and disease and then decay, you got to go ahead and put some words of life in your mouth. So, appeal to a higher law than the law of sin and death. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying instead of talking down about yourself and down about your situation and down about your family, you're going to have to speak a little higher than that. Speak up. Because there's something higher than what you see right now. Don't settle for the words that other people have spoken over your life. You can appeal to a higher authority. You can speak all the way up toward heaven and build your life on the words of the Most High God. What I'm saying is stop speaking from a place of death and defeat. Stop repeating what everybody else is saying on social media. Stop grabbing hold to the popular saying. Stop saying stuff like every time I take a step forward, I get knocked three steps back. No, start saying I am prosperous in all my ways. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Start saying no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. Start declaring out of your mouth, I have given, and it is given to me good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Let me tell you what I confess out of my mouth all the time. I declare that I am a money magnet. Money comes to me from the north, south, east, and west. I declare right now, somebody's right now looking for me to put some money in my hand to help fund the vision God has given to me. Why? I'm faithful in giving to God. I'm faithful in honoring God with the tithe. So I command my angels to go out there, round up all the harvest that belongs to me, bring it in supernaturally. You want to know what I say about myself? I say from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet, come on, I am healed and whole and well. I declare every organ in my body, every tissue in my body functions perfectly in the name of Jesus. I say every disease or germ that touches this body has got to die instantly in the name of Jesus. Why? My words have power. My words make a difference. Why? I'm made in the image and likeness of God. Week number three in our freedom curriculum says this. It says, with words, God spoke the entire universe into being. Words and language was his idea. And his words are literally life to us. Because God created man in his image, our words have power. Say, my words have power. My words have power. You didn't say it like you mean. Say, my words have power. My words have power. Put your hand over your chest. Say, self, self. understand this. Understand. My, words my words have power. Then it goes on to say, every time we open up our mouths to talk, we either advance the kingdom of life or we advance the kingdom of death. What are you saying? 
Proverbs 4 says, my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear toward my words, God said. Do not let these words out of your sight. Keep these words in the middle of your heart. These words are life to those who find them. These words are health or healing to one's whole body. And above everything else, guard your heart, for everything that you do flows from your heart. What he's saying is you got to watch what you allow to come into your heart. I keep telling this over and over. It keeps coming back around. Everything we hear and everything we see has an effect on us. You can watch whatever you want to watch. You can listen to whatever you want to listen to. Don't, don't come and ask us as pastors, is it okay to listen to this? You can, you can listen to whatever you want to listen to. The question is, is that healthy for my spirit? Nobody's here to regulate you. This, this, is, not, this is not preschool. This is not some spiritual nursery. You're, you're a grown spiritual man or woman. You can listen to whatever you want to listen to. You can watch whatever you want to watch. You ain't got to sneak. Stop sneaking. Watch it boldly, man. Just understand, everything I watch, everything I see is having an impact on me. Everything I listen to, everything I see is having an impact on me. So if, if you want the results of your life to be the product of what you just sowed into your heart, then keep watching it. But if you realize I'm putting more death in me than life, and I want to turn that around and change what you're listening to. Come on, somebody. Change how much you're seeing the wrong stuff and watch and see if that doesn't change your life. See, we got to control whatever bombards our ears and saturates our souls. We also need, watch us to put a gauge on our tongues. Put a gauge on our tongues so we, so, we, so we can decide that our words will not cross a specific line so we can manage that decision every day. So we need a gauge on our tongue. They, they, uh, David said, Lord, put, put, put a guard at my lips. We need a gauge on our tongues. And you know what a gauge is? A gauge is a device for measuring magnitude, the amount or the contents of something. Like a scale is a type of gauge. That's why you can't be getting mad and cussing at the scale. The scale is like, this is what I feel. <laughs> it ain't personal. I'm just trying to read. I'm reading to you what I'm feeling. <laughs> I remember one time, we had, a couple years ago, we had just come back from a cruise. We love cruising. That's our favorite way to vacation. And we had just come back from one of those cruises. And if, you don't, if you've never been cruising, one thing is about cruising. You pay your one fee, and you eat all you want to eat. That can be good and bad. Because on cruises, you know, I, I normally don't eat late at night, and I, I don't, normally don't eat many carbs. But on cruises, after I'm paying my money, <laughs> I'm eating pizza at 1230 in the morning. I'm taking some slices to the room. They got an ice cream station. You can eat all you want to eat. I'm getting ice cream cones and, and something they let you make it yourself. So I'm, I'm pulling the thing down, and I'm, I'm acting like I work on an ice cream truck. I'm just building a little tower with it. Ate all that food on the cruise, and I got home. And that scale was staring at me. My first thought was, wait a few days before you get on it. And I just wanted to see. So I, I got on the scale. And, and all I can say is, I, I took off anything that could add weight. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> and I'm standing on that scale. And I first, when I first got on it, you know, it, 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 it tried to register a number. And it, it, it registered a number. And it kept going up, 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 up. up till I found myself on the scale and I was standing like this. <laughs> As if by not letting all my weight go. Watch well, this. The scale is just a gauge. And what we're saying is we're going to have to put a gauge on our words. Why? Because our words have power. And by learning to speak words of life that line up with God's words, our words can change our environment and change our relationships. Watch this. And break the grip of the enemy's words off of us. Last thing we got to do right here, key number three. You got to turn up. Turn all the way up. I don't mean, you know, turn up. <laughs> what I mean by turn up is you're going to have to decide today, watch this, to rely on God completely. What I mean is you're going to have to put all your eggs in God's basket and stop having a plan B and a plan C. What I mean is it's time to see what life could really look like if we gave God the love and devotion and obedience and sacrifice he deserves. What I'm saying is ask yourself this question right here. Who or what is holding me back from going all in with God? What I'm saying is it's time to get off the shore, man. Some of you have been living your whole life right here on the shoreline. And God is saying it's time to launch out into the deep. See, I'm, I love the fish. The, 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 the fish that you catch on the shore are real different than the ones out there in the deep waters. 
The ones in the deep waters are bigger. And God is saying, if you want me to grow you to a big fish, you're going to have to get away from the shoreline. You're going to have to do more than just the, 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 the uh, obligatory come to church on Sunday. That's great. But what else are you going to give? What else can you offer? What else can you strip away? What else are you willing to do? Are you willing to shed anything and everything that is holding you back from going all the way with God? What I'm saying is, ladies, you can't, you can't have one foot in, 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 in God, and you're praying, asking him, Lord, send me my mate. I'm believing you for my mate. And then with the other foot, you're out here dressing like women in the world, trying to catch a man the world's way. I'm not condemning you. I'm trying to talk to you like I talk to my own daughter. You can't have one foot in God. And the other foot out here, you're dating this person and you're flirting with this person and yeah. talking to this person and going out with this person. But then at the same time, in the back of your mind, you're just doing this to have fun for a little while while I believe God for my mate. Can I tell you this? God is not going to send you anybody worth having while you got all these other doors open. See, God is not a player. So he's going to wait for you to get single-hearted enough, content in him enough to say, I'm willing, Lord, to wait until whoever you send at least seems to be the right one, one worth exploring. I'm saying it's, it's, it's Hebrews 12 one time. It says, ask for us. We have this large crowd of witnesses around us. So then let us get rid, let's rid ourselves of everything that's getting in our way. And let's get rid of the sin that holds on to us so tightly and let us run with determination the race that is set before us. All God is saying is that it's time to take inventory, not to judge yourself, not to go back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not to get critical on yourself and start feeling bad and condemned, but it's time to get honest with myself. Let me take this mask off. Stop acting a certain way like I got it all together. Let me just admit I don't have it all together. Let me tell you from the stage, I don't have it all together. I wish I could tell you as your, as your pastor, your bishop, I, I got it all together. I have the right thoughts all the time. I always do the right thing. I always make the right decisions. I wish I could tell you that. That's not true. I can tell you I'm trending up. I can tell you every year of this spiritual walk, as I get honest with God, honest with myself, my life in Christ is getting better and better. And what God is saying is, can you take a look at your life and identify anything you know is holding you back, hindering you? Are you willing to bring it to the altar and at least have a conversation with me about it? I want to leave you with this. There are two ways here at Impact Church, two main ways that we help people get free. One of them is through our counseling center. And if you're a member of this church, it is absolutely free to you. We have trained counselors that are ready to have an appointment with you, to talk with you about your marriage, about your single life. If you're feeling depressed, we got a financial planner on our staff who will help you put together a financial plan. If you got troubles with your teenager, maybe you are a teenager having struggles with your fa family, it is ludicrous. It's absolutely silly to sit and watch your life fall apart because you're too prideful to admit you need help. Can I just say this? Everybody needs help sometime. Everybody. I went through a season about a year and a half ago, March of last year, where I found myself, I've grown so much, I've, I've stripped so many things away, but I found myself still struggling mentally with a couple things. I found myself keep making the same reoccurring bad decisions in certain areas. And I realized that I, I'm having a hard time breaking free from something from my past. I couldn't go to anywhere here in town because I wouldn't be able to feel comfortable being honest. So I went to a counseling center up in Ohio, sat down with a Christian therapist for three days. And for three days, I just did a word vomit. For three days, I just talked about my past. I talked about stuff that hurt me as a child. For three days, I talked about stuff that right now that you know, being a leader in front of people all the time, it's tough at times. And I just got honest. And for three days, I cried my eyes out talking to this man. For three days, I just exhaled and, and stopped feeling like I had to hold it in and act like I had it all together. And this man didn't tell me anything profound, nothing from the Bible I hadn't heard before. But I, can I tell you this? When I walked out of that place in March of last year, I have never been that free. And I've been continually getting more free every single month. And, I, and I'm growing closer to God in ways that I never was before. But it started with me coming to a place of realizing not, nothing wrong with you because you need to talk to somebody. You need some therapy. What's wrong is if you're too prideful to be to sit down and own up to the fact that all of us need some help at some point. Amen. Second way we help people get freedom is through small groups. And if you've not participated in a small group, I'm asking you. September 8th, we start a new semester. Go out there to the small group hub in the lobby. 
Talk to them about the different groups we have. Find one that fits for you. But I want to also ask that some of you in here right now, this is not your season to participate in another group. It's your season to lead a group. And I especially need some people to help us lead some freedom groups. The reason I'm teaching this right now, I'm giving you a few weeks of this, but we got 12 weeks of walking people through freedom to help you get to the freedom that God wants you to have. And so we're going to have some general groups, freedom groups, but then we're going to also add some specialty freedom groups. So I had a couple of people reach out to me. I had a guy reach out to me this week and said, Pastor, for years I struggled with pornography. I know what it's like to, to be addicted to that computer and, and just keep feeling bad about myself and condemned because I keep doing what I said I wasn't going to do again. He said, I want to help some other guys get free. Would it be okay to have a group like this? I said, absolutely. And somebody else reached out to me and said, Pastor, I want to help some people get free that may be struggling with their identity. I'm not talking about a group to argue over, is, is, is this right or is this wrong? Did God make me this way or not this way? See, I'm talking about people that have already acknowledged, I know that God made me this way, but I'm struggling with these same-sex attractions, and I want to get free. I don't, I don't want to struggle with this. And I said, absolutely put a group together like that. And somebody else may want to do a group for help people get free from grief. Somebody else may want to help people that have been battling alcoholism. Somebody else may want to help people that have been struggling with promiscuity. But I need some people to help me help some other people break free from what the enemy thought he was going to take them to their grave with. But no, they're going to be free. Come on, man. Whom the sun set free is free indeed. And I'm asking you, will you help me help some other people get free? Say, I'm not fully free myself, even if you're still on your journey. Let us help you help others at the same time. Because God didn't say you had to all be already there before you come back and help somebody know which way they got to go to get there. Come on, give God a shout and a praise in this place. <laughs> Woo! All right, every head bowed, every eye closed in prayer. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord, you've never had a moment in your life where you fully surrendered everything to him. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I want you to know today, like I said earlier, God loves you right where you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. And the only thing he's asking you to do is to surrender your life fully to him. He's not asking you to promise you'll change this and I'll stop doing that. Just come to him and surrender your entire life to him right where you are. Let him change you on the inside and he'll take you by the hand step by step and help you gain victory in the other areas of your life. Step one, you got to go ahead and surrender to him. So if you're here today and you're ready to do that, I'm just ready to surrender. I don't know what else it means, but I am ready to surrender to, to Christ. If that's you, I'm going to count to three in just a moment. Every head is bowed, eyes are closed, and so nobody's looking at you. When I get to three, I'm going to ask you to be bold and lift up your hand. Let me know, yes, I want you to include me in this prayer, Pastor. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front of the church. I'm going to pray for you right there in your seat or right there online, wherever you happen to be. But I need you to let me know, to include you in on this prayer by raising your hand when I count to three. Here we go. One, two, three. I'm going to lift it up. Beautiful. Hands all over the auditorium. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Another hand there, another hand there. Thank you, another hand there. Thank you. One, two hands there. Thank you, another hand there. Beautiful, another hand there. Thank you. I see that hand, another hand right there. Come on, anybody else? Lots of hands have gone up. The only one I haven't seen is yours. I'm just waiting on you. If you know something is telling you to get in on this, that's the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and raise your hand if you have not done so already. Anybody else before we pray? Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Here we go right here. Every one of you that raised your hand, even those online that raised your hand, whisper this prayer right there to your seat. Say, Dear God in heaven, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place. He paid the price for my sin, but I believe you raised him from the dead, and he's alive right now. So Jesus, come into my heart now. Save me. Forgive me. Make me brand new. I surrender my life to you for the rest of my days. And according to the Bible, I am right now born again. Amen. 